Let us assume, as a working hypothesis, that under the impact of a force or the influence of an agent, and the Earth does not travel in an empty universe, the axis of the Earth shifted or tilted. At that moment, an earthquake would make the globe shudder. Air and water would continue to move through inertia, hurricanes would sweep the earth and the seas would rush over the continents carrying gravel and sand and marine animals and casting them on the land. Heat would be developed, rocks would melt, volcanoes would erupt, lava would flow from the fissures in the ruptured ground and cover vast areas. Mountains would spring up from the plains and would travel and climb on the shoulders of other mountains, causing faults and rifts. Lakes would be tilted and emptied, rivers would change their beds, large land areas with all their inhabitants would slip under the sea. Forests would burn, and the hurricanes in the wild seas would wrest them from the ground on which they grew and pile them branch and root in huge heaps. Seas would turn into deserts, their waters rolling away. And if a change in the velocity of the diurnal rotation, slowing it down, should accompany the shifting of the axis, the water confined to the equatorial oceans by centrifugal force would retreat to the poles, and high tides and hurricanes would rush from pole to pole carrying reindeer and seals to the tropics and desert lions into the Arctic, moving from the equator up to the mountain ridges of the Himalayas and down to the African jungles and crumbled rock torn from splintering mountains would be scattered over large distances and herds of animals would be washed from the plains of Siberia. The shifting of the axis would also change the climate in every place, leaving corals in Newfoundland and elephants in Alaska, fig trees in northern Greenland and luxurious forests in Antarctica. In the event of a rapid shift of the axis, many species and genera of animals on land and in the sea would be destroyed, and civilizations, if any, would be reduced to ruins. Water evaporated from the oceans would rise in clouds and fall again in torrential rains and snowfalls. Clouds of dust ejected by numerous volcanoes and swept by hurricanes from the ground, and possibly dust clouds of extraneous origin if a cometary train of meteorites was the foreign body causing the upheaval, all this dust would keep the rays of the sun from penetrating to the earth. temperature under the clouds would be reduced, but close to the ground it would be higher than normal because the heated earth would, by convection, dissipate its heat into the atmosphere. Great streams would be formed by the melting ice of the polar regions, carried out of the polar circle and heated by the ground. Glaciers from the mountains would dissolve and inundate valleys. In higher and intemperate latitudes, the falling snow would turn to water or even vapor before reaching the ground or soon thereafter. For many months and probably years, the snow falling on the ground would melt and run in great streams to the sea, cutting new river channels and carrying off great masses of debris. Falling again and again in a sunless world, the snow, shielded from the sun's rays by thick clouds enveloping the earth, would finally cool the ground to a point where it would turn, not into water, but into ice. At first this ice would not lie firmly on the ground. From inclines and slopes it would slide down to the deeper valleys and then towards the sea. Large icebergs would fill the sea and, tossing about, melt and drop a load of stones or other detrimental material to the bottom. Other icebergs, floating over valleys filled with water, would deposit their loads there. In the course of the years, the incessant action of the snow would cool the ground in the higher latitudes to such an extent that permanent cover would be built, and the earth would go on shuddering for centuries, slowly quieting down as the time passed one after another the volcanoes would burn themselves out. Assuming now that this working hypothesis is wrong, we are faced with the necessity of finding a special explanation for each and every phenomenon observed. The mountains rose from the beds of the seas and folded and faulted. What generates the enormous forces that bend, break, and mash the rocks in the mountain zones? Why have sea floors of remote periods become the lofty highlands of today? These questions still await satisfactory answers. 
climate changed and the continental ice cover formed. At present, the cause of excessive ice making on the lands remains a baffling mystery, a major question for the future of Earth's riddles. Species and genera of animals were extinguished. The biologist is in despair as he surveys the extinction of so many species and genera and the closing of the Pleistocene, or the Ice Age. Equally sudden and unexplained changes accompanied the close of each geological period. What caused tropical forests to grow in polar regions? What caused volcanic activity on a great scale in the past and lava flows on land and in the ocean beds? What caused earthquakes to be so numerous and violent in the past? Puzzlement, despair, and frustration are the only answers to each and every one of these phenomena. The theories of uniformity and evolution maintain that the geological record bears witness that from time immemorial, even from the time this planet began its existence, only minute changes caused by the wind blowing on the rocks, the sand grains swimming to the sea accumulated into vast changes. These causes, however, are inadequate to explain the great revolutions of nature, and they evoke expressions of futility on the part of the specialists, each in his field.